Happy 4th of July, America. Yes, I'm a proud Canadian, but I never fail to thank my lucky stars for our neighbors. The champion of democracy and capitalism, they brought human progress to new heights. The Americans have. Tonight, we bring you an inspirational story. The book is called Through the Perilous Fight, Six Weeks That Saved a Nation. It describes a critical period of time in the War of 1812. Let's go to 1814. The Brits burn the White House and come close to beating their former colony. Events that inspire the American National Anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. We recently caught up with author Steve Vogel, who's a columnist at the Washington Post, to discuss the significance of these events, the meaning of the 4th of July, which this week shares the 150th anniversary of the decisive Battle of Gettysburg and the American Civil War. Well, you know, ironically, um, many of the people involved in uh, the creation of the Star Spangled Banner and, and uh, who were at Fort McHenry, including the, the garrison commander, uh, they were from um, families that were uh, Southern sympathizers during the Civil War. And the, uh, the grandson of Major Armistead, who was the big hero at Fort McHenry, was actually fought for the Confederacy and was killed at uh, Gettysburg, leading uh, a charge at Cemetery Ridge. Um, and Francis Scott Keyes, his own grandson, was also a Southern sympathizer and, and during the Civil War was held uh, for, for a while as a prisoner at Fort McHenry. So it, he, he thought that was uh, richly ironic that uh, uh, the, the American flag would be flying over him as he's being held a, a prisoner at Fort McHenry. Mr. Vogel, I wasn't around, uh, you know, in the 1840s and 50s. I don't know how many people could imagine a war between the states, but it would appear that no one can imagine it now. Would you say that it is the legacy of the Civil War, that it was so absolutely horrible that no decent American could even fathom the idea of another war of the states? I think uh, after, after peace finally came, uh, you can safely say that no American, be they in the South, or the North wanted uh, another war, anything like the one that had just ended. It had absolutely devastated uh, families on both sides of, uh, of the, in the Union and the Confederacy. And uh, the amount of blood that had been shed uh, was enough that uh, no one wanted to see another war. In your book, you talk about some of the myths uh, revolving around the burning of, of Washington. Let's go after uh, one of the, the, the key myths that uh, the British were burning down Washington in the War of 1812 because of revenge, that revenge motivated this. But weren't the British burning down a lot of cities, uh, not for revenge, just for the reasons that uh, armies burn cities? That's, that's, that's how they win wars. That's right. Um, Rear Admiral George Coburn, uh, who commanded a Royal Navy squadron in the Chesapeake region, uh, had had attacked a number of towns uh, in the Chesapeake uh, and essentially he was waging a, a, a type of warfare that was pretty similar to that of William Tecumseh Sherman a half century later in, in the Civil War. Uh, Admiral Coburn, you know, believed that American citizens were the ones who should be paying the price for, for this war. Uh, he believed that by attacking the commerce, you know, burning plantations, uh, causing a lot of destruction to homes and uh, ships, he could make this war so costly that he could uh, force the United States to make peace on, on British terms. wonder if you could uh, help us with something. Uh, there are all kinds of uh, myths uh, around uh, the burning down of the White House and why the White House is white and all of it uh, flows from, from 1812. So what actually got burned and, and why is it so white today? Well, the, the White House was completely burned. Uh, it was uh, along with the, the U.S. Capitol, which included the, the um, Supreme Court and the Library of Congress. Every government building in Washington, save one, was, was burned by the British. So the level of devastation to federal Washington was quite complete. Now, the White House had, had been the presidential mansion at that point for about 14 years. And um, the British used rocket powder paste uh, which they spread around the uh, the mansion, you know, rubbed it on the the doors and windows, uh, and they found uh, quite a bit of flammable material, including the drapes, 
they, they set fires throughout the mansion. So the, uh, the level of destruction was quite great. The, the only thing that was really remaining afterwards <laughs> were the exterior sandstone walls. Uh, really, everything inside was pretty much consumed. But the, and I the ironic that got thing some is... sandblast treatment to, to make sure it looks the way it does? Well, uh, they, they, of course, rebuilt the building. That took several years. But the, uh, the building had been uh, whitewashed from the start. Uh, so it, it was white before the, the war, and people often uh, used the White House as a, as a nickname before the War of 1812. Now, uh, as part of the renovation, they, they put on several coats of white lead paint to, to better hide the, uh, the scars uh, and scorch marks. Um, so it was, uh, it was certainly the, the white paint was needed to, to cover the war damage, but the, the name had, had existed for, for some time already. What about uh, Mrs. Madison, uh, the First Lady Dolly, um, and uh, the business of rescuing the portrait of, of Washington? Now, there's an interesting story there. Yeah, and she's, um, she's considered uh, a heroine for her actions, and she, she certainly deserves credit for um, having the, the idea that the portrait should be saved. You know, the British, on August 24th, 1814, had scattered the American defenses outside of Washington at Bladensburg and they were moving toward the city. There was really no defense left. And President Madison, who'd been at the battle, uh, sent word ahead to Dolly that she should, she should leave immediately. And um, Dolly had time to, to gather some belongings. And on her way, as she was being escorted out to a carriage, she, she saw the portrait of George Washington um, uh, by Gilbert Stuart. And that portrait, in just the 15 years uh, since Washington's death, had become already something of an iconic symbol for the country. And she realized that um, it, it should not fall into British hands. And she issued instructions to the, uh, her servants to take it down. Now, you know, over time, that story's kind of been changed to, to Dolly Madison, you know, cut out the portrait herself and, and took it with her when she left. Um, she actually ordered the, the servants to do it. Uh, so while she certainly deserves credit for, for uh, having the foresight to do that, uh, she, uh, the, the myth gets uh, a bit embellished over the years. Let's uh, focus on Madison for a moment because we're honoring America, your country today on this uh, July 4th. James Madison, one of the architects of the Constitution. James Madison, a great thinker. Anyone who doubts that can just read the Federalist Papers. Would you say that uh, Madison was more successful, uh, leaves a bigger legacy uh, for America as a thinker and as a constitutionalist than he does as a president? I think that goes with uh, absolutely um, without any uh, uh, any disagreement. Uh, Madison was uh, uh, had a fairly disastrous run as commander in chief. Uh, you know the, the the very declaration of war, which he supported, um, was a, a a great risk for uh, the United States at that time. We had a very small military, uh, small army and navy, and we were taking on Great Britain, uh, which of course, with its Royal Navy. Uh, ruled the, the seas and, uh, and of course had a, a number of, of troops up in British North America, uh, then uh, Upper Canada and Lower Canada. Um, so uh, Madison's performance as Commander-in-Chief uh, certainly left a lot to be desired, but uh, at the critical point when Washington is burned, he, re he realized that a show of strength was, was necessary and uh, he came back to the burned out city almost as soon as the British left and um, insisted that the, the capital not be abandoned. Mr. Vogel, uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, happy Independence Day to you and your great nation, and good luck with your book, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.